كل ما ناديت يا رب قل يا عبدي أنا الله 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 This is the sunnah. So inshallah Allah will bring our hearts together. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna alhamdulillah. Ahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'inuhu. Wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina. Wa min sayyati a'malina. له من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن مضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم شر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد ما دي أبوز أسستس Our topic for today 10 points 10 things If you do them they will entitle you, insha'Allah, for Allah's life. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us among those whom Allah loves. Amen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us with our most beloved one, our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in Jannah al To love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something must be there. It's something obligatory to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because his favors, blessings are numerous. He's our creator. He brought us from nothing into being to worship him. He made everything for us. He created everything for us. Look around you, my dear brother and sister, and see everything serves you or human being. Have you thought of that? See the animals, see the plants, see the inanimate. They are all serving you, son of Adam. Are you following? Everything is created for you. As one of our Mashaykh, Rahimahullah, he said, look around you and you'll find yourself you are the master. The human being is the master. If you look, what do you see around you? You will see non-living things, right? Which we call them inanimates. You will see plants. You will see animals and human beings. And nothing else. Are you following? If we want to classify them, and arrange them from the least complex to the most complex, which will come down. Inanimate. Like for instance, the soil, the earth, or the plant. What's next? The plant. What's next? The animal. Who's in top? The human being. The animal serves the plant. The plant serves the animal. And the animal serves you. And all the three are serving you. 
and who made them subservient to you, your Creator? So you should thank this Creator, love this Creator from the core of your heart, who made everything and made you the master. Are you following? But unfortunately, son of Adam is ungrateful. Man is ungrateful. He forgets and he denies. The blessing of this creator, Azza wa Jal, who took care of you and who protected you from day one when you were something very despicable, a drop of semen in your mother's womb. Who is looking after you? Your creator. Protecting you. Providing every means of protection for you. Are you following brothers? He has even placed you in such a position which is the most suitable to protect you. You know when we are in our mother's womb how we are positioned or located. We are facing the back of the mother. True or not? Your face is facing her back. Why? Because the front part of yours is so soft. So he's protecting the weak part of yours by the back of your mother. And the strongest back of yours is facing her abdomen. He has covered you with three layers to protect you. The placenta, full of liquid, Fluid, what for? Any shock it will be absorbed. The wall of the uterus and the abdomen. Are you following? Because he is al hafil He is the protector. He is protecting you. Nine months in your mother's womb. He is feeding you when you were helpless. Everything comes to you through the umbilical cord. Your mother passes it to you. We came to this life. That umbilical cord is scissors cut immediately by the midwife, true? When you were in your mother's womb, there was only one source for food for you. You came out into this life, Allah already prepared to rest for you ready. In winter they are warm, in summer they are cool. Are you following? This is Allah. This is the Creator. Who should be thanked all the times, who should be loved from the bottom of the heart. But man is ungrateful. قُتِلَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا أَكْفَرَهُ مِنْ أَيِّ شَيْءٍ خَلَقَهُ مِنْ نُطْفَةٍ خَلَقَهُ فَقَدَّرَهُ Man is ungrateful. He forgets his creator. So that's why we need to remind each other about this important thing. And that is to love Allah. But what is amazing that despite your ungratefulness, he loves you.
He loves you. He feeds you. You sin. You disobey. Still. He feeds you. He protects you. He gives you everything. True or not? Once I read that a sinner came to a wise man and said, Oh, Sheikh, I cannot give up sinning. He said, Fine. So if you want to sin, never eat from Allah's provision, never sin in his land, look for a place where he cannot see you. Then you can sin. He said, everything is his. He said, don't you feel shy of yourself? He feeds you and you disobey him. He sees you and you sin. Will you commit a shameful deeds if your father is watching you? Your mother, your wife, your daughter? No. And Allah, you don't mind. He's watching you and there is no haya. You don't have this haya. And on top of all of that, he says, as long as you turn to me, as long as you ask me to forgive you, I will forgive you. My door is open for you. Not only that. He comes every night. He descends every night, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he asks, anyone wants forgiveness? Anyone wants sustenance, provision? I will grant it to him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to be loved for many reasons. Because he is the creator, he is the bestower of all these things we have. As he says, وَآتَاكُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ مَا سَأَلْتُمُونَ وَإِنْ تَعُدُّ نَعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَظَلُومٌ كَفَّارٌ and he gave you of all that you asked for. All that you asked for, he gave you. And if you count the blessings of Allah, never will you be able to count them. Verily, man is indeed an extreme, an extreme wrongdoer, a disbeliever. This is Surah Ibrahim, Surah 14, Ayah 34. He has given you everything. Everything you want, He has given it to you. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can you count the blessings of Allah? Can you tabulate them? Sit down and say, this, this, is, the, this is the number. Come up with the figure. You cannot. You cannot. You cannot count the blessings of God upon you. See the blessing of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. These blessings, so many, you cannot count them. And yet you are ungrateful. This creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. One day, he saw a woman running here and there, here and there, looking for her child. And then she found her baby. She held the baby, and the Sahaba were watching. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Do you think this lady?" will throw or cast her 
child, this mother, will throw her child into the fire? What do you think? A mother who was crazy looking for her child, can she throw the child to the fire? No way. He said, by Allah, Allah loves you more than this, more the love of the mother to her child. Imagine. Imagine. That he loves you more your own mother. Shouldn't you love him? He loves you more, your own, more than your own mother. Allah must be loved also because he's the most beautiful thing. Nothing is more beautiful than Allah. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us among those who will look at his face in the death. Amen. You look at the face of Allah and he talks to you. Oh my God. of the heavens and the earth. the most beautiful, my dear brothers and sisters. أشرقت الأرض بنور ربها ووضح الكتاب وجيء بالنبيين والشهداء وقضي بينهم بالحق وهم لا يظلمون and the earth will shine with the light of its Lord and the book will be placed open and the prophets and the witnesses will be brought forward and it will be judged between them with truth and they will not be wronged. This is in Surah Zumar, Surah 39, Ayah 69. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he comes, the whole earth will be illumined Illumined by the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the Jannah, you look at him and he talks to you. <clears throat> because there is a day in the Jannah where we visit Allah. Allah says, لَهُمْ مَا يَشَاءُونَ فِيهَا وَلَدَيْنَا مَزِيدٌ They will have whatever they want and more. مَزِيد more. The Prophet ﷺ said the more is seeing Allah. seeing Allah in the Jannah. And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, the people of the Jannah, they come on a day like Friday. 
from the different levels of the Jannah to a place in the Jannah. Sitting on pulpits and chairs of light. And then clouds of musk will rain on them, empty their water, but the water is musk, the liquid is musk. And then the wind in the Jannah will start blowing musk. And then Allah appears. Bright faces, shiny faces, looking at Allah. Aren't you looking for a word for that? To see your Lord in the Jannah? <clears throat> now, you see Allah and He talks to you. And after that Allah says, O oh, my servants, get up. Go to the market of the Jannah. There is Su market in the Jannah. And pick from that market whatever you want. And then go back to your families. You go back to your family in the Jannah. Your wife sees you and you see your wife. You say, oh my dear wife, you are more beautiful than when I left you. And she says, oh my dear husband, you are more has handsome than when you left me. Where did they get this beauty from? Tell me now. Because both of them, they see, they saw Allah. You saw Allah, and the woman also they saw Allah. So, the beauty increased. The Prophet Sallallahu he described the beauty of Yusuf, the beauty of Prophet Yosef, Yusuf Alayhi He got half the beauty of the human beings, only half of it, of the human beings. And because of that, the women cut there, they cut their fingers without feeling. You know the, the story of Yusuf Alisa. Imagine you are looking at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he loves and he hates, by the way. Allah loves and he hates. He loves those who obeys him. Those who obey him, he loves them. And those who disobey him, he hates them. So he loves and he hates. Because when you disobey Allah, you follow whom? Whom do you follow? Shaitan, the enemy of Allah. And here I want to teach you one thing, or I mean, sorry, share with you something. There's something called the law of love. Have you heard this? Law of love. Love has a law. You know this? Okay. The law says you love what your beloved one loves. And you hate what your beloved one hates. This is the law of love. You love what your beloved one loves. And you hate what your beloved one hates. You love your wife? Do you really love your wife? If you love your wife, you will love whatever she loves. True or not? True? Yeah. If you love her, okay, she loves this color, then I will love it. She loves this flower, I will love it. Because I love my wife. And I will hate what she hates. 
and I will not try to bring what she hates so because I don't want to disturb her. True or not? This is the law of love. Are you following? Didn't the English man say, love me, love my dog? True or not? Love me, love my dog. What, what does it mean, love me, love my dog? If you love me, you will even love my own dog. Which means he's talking metaphorically. Are you following? So you will love me, you will love my family, you will love anything that I love. Even if it reaches the extent that you will love the dog. Are you following? An Arab poet said the same thing like the English man. But the Arabs, they have camels, not dogs. Okay? So what did he say? What did he say? He said, talking about his beloved one, okay? He said, وَأُحِبُّهَا وَتُحِبُّهَا وَيُحِبُّنَا قَتَهَا بَعِيرٌ I love her and she loves me. And my camel loves her she camel. And her she camel loves my camel. See the love? That I love her, there is a mutual love. That I love her and she loves me. Not only that, even my camel loves her she camel. Even the animals, they start loving each other. Are you following? So now, this is the law of love. So who is our beloved one now? Allah. Are you following? So our beloved one is Allah. So we love what he loves and we hate what he hates. Is this clear? Not that we love what he hates and we hate what he loves. Is this clear to your brothers and sisters? Okay. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he loves, Allah says, Inna Allah yuhibbul muhsineen. Verily Allah loves those who do good. Those who do good, Allah loves them. In another place in the Quran, Inna Allah yuhibbul tawwabin wa yuhibbul mutatahhirin. Allah loves those who turn to him in repentance and loves those who purify themselves. So now we know that Allah loves. And when Allah loves you, what does he do? Now, he loves you. What does he do? He talks about it. When Allah loves you, he talks about it. He calls his angels. And he calls Jibreel. Ya Jibreel. إِنِّي أَحْبَبْتُ فُلَانًا فَأَحِبْهَ Allah calls Jibreel. Come here, O oh Jibreel. I am, I love so and so. This my servant so and so, I love him. So you should love him, Jibreel. Jibreel starts loving you. And then Jibreel informs the angels. In heavens, Allah loves so and so, love him. They start loving him. Then Allah puts the love in the hearts of the pious people for you on earth. And the people start loving you. Why? Because the one in heavens already loved you. Are you following? So if you want the people to love you. What should you do? Make Allah love you first. So if Allah loved you, that love will come. And we saw it. The scholars, the people, many scholars we saw who passed away. And the amount of love that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in the hearts of millions and millions of people. And those people, they never saw that particular scholar. But because of its righteousness, piety, the people start loving him. 
Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said in the hadith, this hadith is authentic in Mata Imam Malik. He says, my love is incumbent upon those who love one another for my sake. Allah talks, this is sacred hadith. Those who exchange visits for my sake, those who sit with one another for my sake, and those who put themselves in the service of one another for my sake. Let us reflect on this beautiful hadith. My love, Allah talks, is incumbent upon those who love one another for my sake. That you love each other for the sake of the love. I have nothing to do with you except that I love you for the sake of Allah. I saw in the masjid, for that reason I'm loving you. I don't want anything, not for the sake of the dunya or anything else, no. I love you for the sake of Allah. Those who visit one another, exchange visits. You visit me, I visit you. What for? Because you know, all of you, you know the hadith, or many of you. The one who was going to visit his brother, right? And Allah sent an angel in the form of a human being. And he asked him, where are you heading to? He said, to this town. What for? To visit a brother. What for? I loved him for the sake of Allah. The angel told him, I am an angel sent from Allah, and Allah loves you because you loved him for his sake. Do we visit one another for the sake of Allah? That I just travel even 100 miles, 200 miles, just to visit you for the sake of Allah. Because those who visit one another for the sake of Allah on the day of resurrection, guess what? They will be envied by the prophets and messengers. They envy them. Because they will be sitting on chairs of light. Even the messengers, they envy them. SubhanAllah. Those who sit with one another for my sake, what does it mean I sit with you for the sake of Allah? You remind me, I remind you. Brothers and sisters, do we ask each other about the Imam when we meet? The Sahaba, that's what they were doing. They meet each other, how's your Imam, brother? Do we do, we do with that now? No. Brother, how are you? How's business? How's family? And that's it. We don't ask about the Iman of each other. The Sahaba, after meeting, when they were leaving, they, they would read Wal Asri Nal Insana Lafi, reminding each, each other. The Sahaba used to say, Let us sit down, renewing our Iman. That is sitting for the sake of Allah, to renew our Iman. You remind me, and I remind you. This is what we are missing. Distracted by the dunya. This dunya which is nothing in the sight of Allah. It doesn't weigh in the sight of Allah the weight of the wing of the mosquito, true? That is the whole dunya, it's nothing. You will live 60 years, 70 years, and then after that what? You will live, true or not? You will die. So the real life is that life where you live forever, eternal life. So that's why we need to keep reminding each other about our real home, which is the Jannah, not this dunya. In this dunya, this is the farm we plant. There we live. Are you following? That is the meaning of sitting for my sake. And those who put themselves in service of one another for my sake. I am your brother. What do you need, brother? Huh? Unfortunately, the brotherhood we have is fake, not genuine. Are you following? You come and say, brother, I love you for the sake of Allah. 
it's lip service, doesn't have real value. If you are really my real brother, when I'm in trouble, you stand by me, right? That's the real brother. Friend indeed is a friend in need. True or not? So if you're my real brother, you will stand by me. Let's say now, I, you say, my, I, I have one, two, three, mashallah, we brothers, mashallah. Something happened to me financially or something. So oh, I have a brother, so he can help me. I come to you. Before I start talking, you felt that I came for something. You start your own preambles. Hinting to me, life is costly, expenses, this. You are telling me, please, if you came for financial help, don't ask. Are you following? And then you call that we love one another for the sake of Allah. When we study the life of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een, Ali ibn al Hussein Zain al Abidin. Have you heard of this name, Zain al Abidin? He is the grandson of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Okay? He is the son of al Hussein. See, the Prophet, his daughter Fatima was married to Ali. They had two children, Hassan and Al Hussein has this son, Ali ibn al Hussein. He also called Zain al Abidin. The best of the worshippers. That's the meaning of the name. This Zain al Abidin, every morning the people, poor families, the poor families in Medina, they get up and they found. They, they would find food at their doorsteps. Who put that food? They don't know. Every night, when people are asleep, he starts carrying food, distributing. They only discovered this and found the day he died. They didn't find any food. When, we, when they were giving him the burial wash, they found black spots in his back because of the sacks he carried at night. So this Zain al-Abidin says to his students, do you or does any one of you put his hand in the pocket of his brother and take what he wants and his brother would never ask him what he took. They said, no. He said, you are not my brothers. Are you following? To what extent the true love for brothers was? Another one of the forefathers his friend came to his house, he wants some help. He didn't find his brother. He, the slave girl opened, he said, where is your master? She said, he went out. He said, go and bring his, the chest, safe chest for the money. She brought it, he said, open. She opened, he took money and he left. When her master came, She told him, so and so came and he did this. He said, if really he did that, you are free for the sake of Allah. Because he rejoiced, he felt very happy that this brother, now there are no formalities. Are you following? The barriers have been knocked down. That he treats his brother's money like his. This now when we are reading these stories, this is utopian life. It is a dream, right? No one can believe such stories. Now, let us, inshallah, 
mention these 10 points, insha'Allah, which will, by the grace of Allah, will entitle us for Allah's love. Number one, reading this book. Number one is the Quran. This Quran is everything. It is the shifa and the cure and the heal and the remedy for your heart, for your problems, for your anxieties, for your depressions, for all the ills you have. It is this Quran that transformed the barbaric tribes, the savage tribes in Arabia, and transformed them into barrels of light. This one. This is the book of Allah. It is this Quran that Allah said about it, had we sent it down upon a mountain, you would have seen that mountain splitting the center crumbling, crashing, because of this is the word of Allah. It is this Quran, this book, when Umar ibn al-Khattab heard a few verses of Surah Taha, he embraced Islam. You know the story of Umar Allah. He came out angrily looking for the Prophet Sallallahu to kill the Prophet Sallallahu And he found one of the Sahaba, one of the, from Quraysh, said, where are you going, Umar? He said, I'm looking for Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi He said, do you think if you kill Muhammad, Banu Hashim will leave you? That's number one. Number two, Islam is already in your house. Islam is already in your house. He said, what are you saying? He said, your daughter, your sister Fatima is a Muslim. And her husband, Saeed. They are Muslims. Go first of all and see your family. He went. Khabbab also was there teaching them the Quran. When they heard Umar, everyone hid himself. Who remained to face Umar? Who remained? Fatima. He said, Asabati. The Quraysh, the Arabs, they used the word Sabaa. Sabaa means what? He left his deen. They consider paganism the deen. He said, Bal aslamt. I became Muslim. Umar got angry and you know, he slapped her. Umar anhu was gigantic. You know that. That the Prophet in the, in, the, in the last hajj he was telling Umar, slow down Umar, don't crush the people. Imagine he's slapping his sister he start bleeding. And she is standing firm in front of him. No one could stand in front of him. But it's the Iman. Are you following? The Iman. When he saw the blood is flowing, her, his heart start to soften. And she was holding few pages of ayat written on them of Surah Taha. He said, give me. He said, you are impure. If you want to read, go and wash yourself. He went and he read. And then he said, where is Muhammad? This ayat softened him. Where is Muhammad? A few minutes ago, he's looking to kill him. Now I want to become a Muslim. Where is he? They took him to the Prophet ﷺ. and he entered. Ashhad an la ilaha illallah wa ashhad anka Rasulullah. It is this book that did that. Umar before Islam, 
that he said many times, he said before Islam, two things now, if I recall any one of them, though the story, if we want to apply the science of hadith, there is no Islam. But he said there are two things before Islam I used to do. If I recall now, any one of them, one makes me laugh, the other one makes me cry. The one that makes me laugh, I used to have an idol made of date. So I worship this idol. And when I get angry, I eat this idol. So my God, the God I worship, I eat. Then I make another God. So when now I recall, remember this, those days, I laugh at my stupidity. The other thing that make me cry, I buried my daughter alive. Because the Arabs before Islam, they were burying their daughters alive. He took his daughter. The mother said, where are you taking the girl? He said, no, no, we are visiting some people. Take her to the desert and he started digging. While he was digging, the dust was falling in his beard. And the little girl, the little girl is removing the dust from his beard. And he buried her life. So he said, whenever I, I recall this scene, I cry. But after Islam, what happened? Umar was the friend of the shaitan before Islam. After Islam, the shaitan, when he sees Umar, he runs away. What made the shaitan runs of Umar? Runs away. It's the iman of Umar, which is this book again. Are you following? This book, my dear brothers and sisters, which we have or as Muslims, come back to it, read it, understand it, get the tafsir, interpretation in your mother tongue, in your own mother tongue, English, French, whatever, and read with contemplation, with pondering, reflection, not you read it in a parrot fashion, as many Muslims of Ramadan, they do. They compete with one another. How many khatma did you make? How many times you read it? Did you understand it? Because the one who talks to you is your creator. Have you ever found a book? Listen to this. Have you ever found a book in its introduction, in the beginning, challenges the reader i want to have a look at that book have you ever you find the book is challenging the reader telling the reader i challenge you to find any mistake within me have you found a book like that have you ever read in your life a book like that <coughs> or you found always in the introduction the preface that the author is apologetic And begging you, if you find any typo mistakes, or any grammatical mistakes, or anything, this is my address, right? And then second revision, third revision, etc. But this book, in the first chapter, challenging you, asking you, go find a mistake. And this challenge is there 1400 years ago and no one met the challenge. And no one will meet the challenge. Because it is the word of Allah. It is the speech of Allah. Are you following brothers and sisters? This book, it talked about past, present, future. It talked about the past, mentioned many events that happened in the past. So much so, it mentioned names 
that only recently historians found out. You know this? The Quran mentioned Haman. Who's Haman? The minister of the Pharaoh. Fir'aun, the king of Egypt, the one who was drowned. The one who was at the time of Moses. You can go and search in the Google and you'll see the, the mummy of the Pharaoh, Fir'aun, who was drowned and Allah saved his body. His minister was Haman. The Quran mentioned Haman. Some of the Orientalists who are hunting in the troubled water, they said there isn't any character in the history as Haman. And recently they discovered, they found in Egypt, big rock, a slate. And it is the list of names and Haman is there. Who told Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Who told him about these things? So the Quran mentioned the past, the perished nations, and also the present. A challenge, the Quran says, Tabbat yada abi lahabin wata. May the hands of Abu Lahab perish. May Abu Lahab be destroyed. Who's Abu Lahab? The Prophet's uncle. Right? So the Quran is saying that Abu Lahab is going to the hellfire. This is the present. The Prophet is telling you, my uncle, you're going to hell. This is a challenge. If it is Muhammad's book, Abu Lahab could have come and say, No, Mike, no, my nephew, I believe in you. Ashhadu la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Rasulullah. No, my nephew, I believe in the oneness of Allah. There is no deity worthy of worship but Allah, and you are the messenger of Allah, and that will finish the message of the Prophet. True or not? You are saying I'm going to hell, right? No, I believe in you. Why didn't he do that? Believe me, this idea never crossed his mind. Number one. Number two, because the one who gave this Quran is Allah, who knows Abu Lahab will never become a Muslim. Will never. Are you following? Do you understand? So this Quran that talked about past, present, future. Let's say, as you know now, the Orientalists and other people are saying, oh, Muhammad, he copied from the Bible and all that stuff. Which is absolutely not true. And if there are some similarities, no wonder, because the Torah came from Allah. The Gospel came from and the Quran from Allah, the same source. So what's the problem? That's number one. Number two, the message, the message of all the prophets and messengers is one. With respect to the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's one. So similarities are normal, expected. But the Quran mentioned things they are neither in the Torah nor in the Gospel. Are you following? The Quran mentioned things in the future that are going to happen. You know the Muslims, they were praying facing Jerusalem in the beginning, true or not? Jerusalem. In Medina, the Muslims were facing Jerusalem, Palestine. The East and the West belongs to Allah. So if Allah tells us you face this direction, should we obey or disobey? Okay. Obey. The Lord says you face this. Then after that, Allah Azza wa permitted the Muslims 
and allow them to face Jerusalem, uh, Beit al Masjid al Haram, Mecca. And the Quran, see, this is the beauty, this is the, the miracle. The Quran came down and said, You Muslims now are facing Mecca. The fools, Sayyakulu Sufaha'u min al Nas, Ma wallahum an qiblatihim al lati kanu alayha. Are you following now? The fools are going to come and say and ask, Why did you change your qibla? the direction of your prayers. The, the fools are going to come. If this is made by Muhammad وسلم, or he wrote it, the fools should have said to each other, guys, let us prove him wrong. Hmm? Let us prove him wrong. No one should talk. Don't ask the Muslims about why they are facing the... But... The Muslims are reading in the Salah, Sayyakulu Sufaha Umina Nasima Wallahum Anti Blati Malatikanu Alaya. The fools will come and say, They are reading in the Salah. And the fools came and said, Why did you change? <laughs> Allah Akbar. They came and they say, Why did you change? So you are the fools. Sadaq Allah. Allah said the truth. Are you following? So this book. Is the word of Allah, the speech of Allah. When you are reading it, Allah talks to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, غُلِبَتْ الرُّومْ فِي أَدْنَى الْأَرْضِ وَهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ غَلَبِهِمْ سَيَغْلِبُونَ فِي بِضْعَ سِنِينَ You know there was a battle happened between the Christians and the Persians. The Persians, they were what? Fire worshippers. The Christians, Believers, are they following? The mushriks, the Arabs, they were mushriks, pagans, idol worshippers. Which of the two parties is closer to the mushriks? The fire worshippers or the Christians? The fire worshippers. So when the fire worshippers defeated the Christians, the mushriks in Mecca, the pagans, rejoiced. They felt happy. The believers, the Muslims, became sad. Why? Because the Christians are closer to us than others, true or not? That's why in Islam, we marry from among them, the most chaste women among them. We eat their food. Are you following? The Prophet ﷺ, he said about the Christians in Egypt, they are my in-laws. So I respect them and treat them nicely. Are you following? So now, the Muslims are grieving. They are sad. And the pagans are rejoicing. And this ayah came down. Alif la meem ghulibat ar-rum fi adna al-ard wa hum mi ba'di ghalabim sa'li fi bid'i sinin. Said Alif la meem, the Romans, the Christians, were defeated in the lowest part of the earth. This is another scientific miracle in the lowest part of the earth. And they will have, the Christians, the upper hand in a few years. The Bidha from 3 to 9. Abu Bakr Siddiq, he backed with the pagans. Say the Christians will have the victory again. They will have the upper hand. And it happened exactly as Allah said. As Allah said. Because these are prophecies. And the scientific medical here in the ayah, the lowest part on the earth. What is the lowest spot on the face of the globe? Is where the Dead Sea is. Are you following? That's the lowest part. Below the sea level. And that where the battle took place. So the first thing, my dear brothers and sisters, the first thing that will entitle you for Allah's love is this Quran. So read it. Read this beautiful book. Every letter you read, you get 
تن حسنات لا أقول ألف لام ميم حرف ولكن ألف حرف وميم حرف ولام وألف حرف ولام حرف وميم حرف The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said Every letter of the Quran you read Every letter of the Quran you read You get ten hasana I don't count or consider Aim as one letter But Alif is a letter Lam is a letter Meme is So by just reading Alif, Lam, Meme How many hasana you got? Thirty Thirty good deeds you got And Allah multiplies that So make it your habit every day. You read at least one chapter. There are 30 chapters. So if you read every day one chapter, so that you will finish the Quran every month. Are you following? Every month you finish the Quran. So you make a timetable, schedule for yourself. From this time to this time, I read. From this time to this time, I will read this much. So by the Isha time, you finish the chapter. Are you following? So minimum, you need to finish it every month once. <coughs> But we need to read it with understanding. As Allah says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنِ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا Do they not consider the Qur'an with care? Had it been from other than Allah, they would surely have found there in much discrepancy. This is Surah number 4, Surah An-Nisa, Ayah 82. So the Quran is saying, read it. And you will never find any contradiction. Because it is from Allah. If you find a contradiction in the Quran, then it is not from Allah. That's simple. The formula is simple. Find a mistake, find a contradiction, then it is not from Allah. But this Quran came down in the tongue of the Arabs, right? The Arabs were the most eloquent people at their time. And the Quran was a challenge for them. Go, you, and bring one single eye like it. The Arabs were gifted with photographic memories. You know that. You know the Arabs before Islam? They are illiterate. The Arabs were illiterate. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه ومن اتبع هداه إلى يوم الدين أما بعد. We are mentioning still the ten things which entitled you about Allah's love. We mentioned the Quran and then we mentioned. What's the second one? Nafs. The Nawafil. The third one is the Dhikr. For those who want to write them down, I will scan through them quickly. You can jot it down. The fourth one, what Allah loves has more precedence over yours. What Allah loves has more precedence over yours. Number five, is studying thoroughly Allah's names and attributes. Studying thoroughly Allah's names and attributes. That's number five. Number four, that what Allah loves should be more important than what you love. Is this clear? Number five, studying the names of Allah. Studying Allah's names and the attributes of Allah. Number six, express your gratitude to Allah. That means thank Allah all the time for his blessings. When we reach there, we elaborate, inshallah. 
Number seven, humility of the heart. You should be a humble person, humbleness. Humility of the heart. This heart has to be humble. Number eight, having privacy with Allah. How can you have privacy with? With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number nine, being always in the company of the righteous. Always be in the company of the righteous. Number ten, avoid anything that makes your heart distant from Allah. Avoid anything that makes your heart distant from Allah. If insha'Allah you fulfill and you make these things, then you will be entitled for Allah's heart. So the third one is Allah's remembrance, dhikr Allah. So keep your tongue always busy with the dhikr. Always. As a matter of fact, if you see the Islamic teachings, you are always engaged in dhikr. The moment you get up in the morning, Alhamdulillah alladhi, ahyana, ba'da ma amatana wa ilayhi nushur. You start with the dhikr. And throughout your day, you are in the You leave your house, Bismillah tawakkal ta'ala, Allah. You enter your car, Subhanallah, sakhara lana, dhikr. You come back, you are in the dhikr. When you enter your house. From the moment you open your eyes in the morning till you go to sleep, you are in the dhikr of Allah. And you go to sleep, by the dhikr, Bismakallahumma wa ba'atu jambi, or Bismakallahumma amudu ahi. So throughout 24 hours, you are attached, your heart is attached and linked to the Creator. And the tongue is wet because of the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you do this, your heart will be alive, not dead. Because the one who remembers Allah, his heart, is life. The one who doesn't make dhikr, his heart is? Number four, that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves is more important than what I love. It has more precedence over what I love. So now, if what Allah loves and what I love are like this, against each other, which one should I do? What my nafs loves or what Allah loves? Ah, remember the law of love. The law of love says you love what your beloved one loves. Your beloved one is Allah, so you love what he loves. For instance, Fajr time. Adhan, call for the prayer is going on. It is cold. It is winter. What Allah allows me to do? To go to the masjid. What my nafs wants me to do? To stay under the blanket, cuddling with my sweetheart. That's what my nafs wants. Not to miss that warmth of the bed. True or not? What should I do here? If I love Allah. Should I carry on sleeping? Or get up and take wudu and go to the masjid? So what Allah loves comes first. No matter what my nafs wants. No, this is what Allah loves. And you should not think even about what the people will say about you. Throw or not? When someone is in love, does he think about the people? Tell me. You experience love in your life. True or not? Did you think about what the people might say about you? They say it's crazy. You don't care. True or not? The teenagers, they know what I'm talking about. Because you are in love. And that's why they say he's in love. And they say, love is blind, too. 
So when you are in love, you don't care. And you are, if you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do you care what the people would say? No. No. I'm only thinking about what my Lord will say. Is this clear to you, brothers? So now, what Allah loves comes first. What the Prophet ﷺ loves comes first. Even if that goes against my nafs. Because always you should know that your nafs will be always inviting you to goodness or evil. Your nafs, evil, always. Now your nafs will not go, tell you go to the salah. So that's why you have to act to the opposite. Whatever your nafs dictates, do the opposite. And that is jihad. That's the real jihad against the nafs. Because your nafs is your enemy. Imagine your enemies, your nafs, the shaitan. Are you following? This is, these are your enemies. The nafs is your enemy. The shaitan is your enemy. And they work together. Hand in hand. The shaitan and the nafs, they work together. So the only one who can save you from this nafs, the evil of your nafs, and the evil of the shaitan is Allah. So whenever you feel weak, what should you do? Cry to Allah. We are human beings, we feel weak, right? How many times we promised Allah that we will not sin again? But we are human beings. So only Allah can protect us, protect us from our real enemy, which is the shaitan. So that's, that's why there should be constant mujahada, constant Strive against the nafs. Ad aflaha man zakkaha wa qad khaba man dasa. Truly, he succeeds. Okay. Truly he succeeds that purifies it, the nafs, and he fails that corrupts it. So the one who follows his own nafs, he corrupts his nafs. So only this nafs can be purified through the ibadah. The Prophet ﷺ said, the mujahid is the one who strives against his nafs for Allah's sake. Listen to this beautiful hadith. Al-mujahidu man jahada nafsahu fillah. The true mujahid is the one who strives against his nafs for Allah's sake. And this is in Tirmidhi. That's number four. Number five, studying Allah's names. You want to build your imam? You want to strengthen your imam? Read the names of Allah. Study the names of Allah. Understand the meanings of the name of Allah. The names of Allah, they have meanings. So you should understand that. For instance, we'll take one name of Allah. Ar-Razzaq, the provider. What does it mean, the provider? The one who provides. If you understand this name, that name should have impact on your heart. What is the impact? Will you be anxious or worried about your sustenance if he's the provider? No. You should know for sure he is the provider. He will take care of me. 
Yes, in the morning, as the Prophet ﷺ said, you should act like the birds. They leave the nest. And they come back with their stomachs full. So in the morning, you go and look for your livelihood. Are you following? So you tire your limbs, but you never tire your heart. Because you know Allah is the provider. So you will not think, maybe they will terminate me. Maybe I will... Uh, do, uh, they will lose my job. No, because Allah is the, the provider. Don't you know that sometimes you break a stone and you find a worm inside, worms inside the stone? Do you know this? Inside the stone there is worm, alive. Who is providing for that worm? Allah. So you should not, if you really understand the meaning of a razaq, you will never worry about your risk at all. You will look for it, but you will not have that anxiety. This is the fruit of knowing Allah by his names. Take another name. Allah is Al-Basir. What's the meaning of Al-Basir? The one who sees. Allah is all seer. He sees everything. What's the impact? If you believe that he sees you, what is the impact? Will you do anything haram? If Allah is watching you, believe that He is watching you. Will you dare to do something haram? Are you following? Because He is watching me. He is a samia. He hears everything. If you believe that Allah hears everything, will you listen to music? Or you listen to the word of Allah? Will you listen to backbiting and slandering? Are you following? So when you understand the names of Allah Azza wa Jal, that is the fruit and the what you are going to reap from knowing the names of Allah Azza wa Jal. Are you following? If you believe that Allah is al hafiz the protector, what should be the impact? Protector protects or doesn't protect? Tell me. He protects. So if you believe that Allah protects, what is the fruit you are getting? That Allah is my protector. He will protect me from all harms. <laughs> you seek protection by Allah, by the Lord of the night. And the day when it breaks, right? So etc. 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 So this is what you should do. You want to strengthen your iman, that will increase your knowledge about Allah, and this will entitle you for Allah's love. Number six, we have to be great grateful to Allah. We should be always say what? Alhamdulillah. Lip service or from the heart? Heart. From the heart. Alhamdulillah. We are happy. We are content. No matter what happens to us, we are content. Because whatever happens to you, it is khair. You know that? Only even if Allah puts you through tests because He loves you. Prophet Muhammad said what? إِذَا أَحَبَّ اللَّهُ عَبْدًا إِبْتَلَى When Allah loves one of his servants, he puts him through tests. He puts him through tests. Why? For many reasons. To elevate his status in the Jannah. Promotion. You want promotion? Go through the tests. In dunya, if you want to be promoted, you have to do something, right? We'll give you mission, task. Then you will be promoted. You want to be elevated in the Jannah? 
go through the test and pass the test. Are you following? Another benefit for the test, expiations for the sins. Washing away what? Your sins. As the Prophet ﷺ. So much so that you will be walking on the earth without single sin. You die to the Jannah. What do you prefer? Your sins to be washed in the dunya or in the hellfire? Choose. Where you want them to be washed? Here. You don't want to be washed in the hellfire. Are you following? That's why Imam Ibn Qayyim he said, there are two prisons, you have to enter one of them. Two prisons. <coughs> if you enter the prison in the dunya, that means you are living a life in the dunya, pious, righteous, then you will enter the Jannah state. If you were free in the dunya, you didn't enter that prison, you were free, your nafs doing everything, you will enter the prison in the Akhirah, that is hellfire. You choose. Are you following? That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, a dunya is the Jannah for the non-believers. And it is the prison for the believers. The prisoner feels free in the prison. Are his, is his movement, can he move the way he loves? If he is in one room. So you are like that. Your nafs tells you, oh, look, watch, see the haram. No, haram, stop for Allah. Haram, stop for Allah. So you are not free to do whatever you like. So you are in prison. On the day of resurrection, you enter the Jannah. You don't enter the next prison. But if you were here free, you will enter that one. And you choose. Are you following? So when Allah is testing you, don't say, why is this happening to me? Because he loves you. He doesn't want to punish you in the hellfire. He wants to wash you here. And that is better for you. That's why for the Muslim it is win-win. It is a win-win situation. Win-win, always. Some Muslims, ignorant Muslims, they say, why the tsunami, for instance? Muslims were drowned and washed. <coughs> Number one, you know that the one who, uh, who drowns is what? Shaheed and goes straight to the Jannah. Why are you upset for someone going to the Jannah? But they are children. Children are playing in the Jannah already. Prophet Muhammad he saw the children of the Jews, of the Christians, Hindus, Buddhists, on the night of Mi'raj, in the Jannah with Ibrahim. So why are you upset? That's why the Muslim is always saying, Alhamdulillah. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi. We are Allah's and unto him we will return. So always you are grateful to Allah. Number seven, humble person, humbleness, humility. This heart has to be humble heart. Should not have arrogance, pride, down to earth. Are you following? Down to earth. Always look down to yourself and tell your nafs, you are not better than the rest. I am the worst among the rest. That's what you should tell your nafs. Don't look upon the people. Consider everyone is better than you. That's how you will come down to earth. Are you following? Because your nafs tells you, Masha Allah. You are better than this. You are better than that. No, I'm not better. Are you following? So that's how we, can, we should be humble. And the Prophet said, the one who lowers himself for Allah, what Allah does to him? <coughs> Elevates his status. The more you lower yourself for the sake of Allah, become humble, Allah 
raises you above and above. Are you following? And that's how the scholars are. The scholars, they are very humble. Wallahi, we've seen many of them who died, rahimahullah. If you see him in the, in the street, you would not think he's a, he's a scholar. Because of his humbleness. Number eight, this khalwa ma'allah, privacy with Allah. What, is, what, what, what does it mean to have privacy or privacy with Allah? That means you should have time with your nafs. Sit by yourself in a room, close it. One hour, half an hour. Talk to your nafs. Ask your nafs, what did I do? Oh my nafs. What do you want? What do you want to go? Are you following? Muhasabat in nafs. Check your nafs. Umar ibn Khattab, every night, he would take the whip and beat his feet and would say, tell me, where did you go today? What sin did you commit today? Are you following? That's where you discipline yourself. Are you following? That is the self-invention. <coughs> Checking the nafs. Before you go to sleep, ask yourself, what did I do today? Whom did I wrong today? Did I backbite today? Did I slander today? Did I talk evil today? and make a step far before you go to sleep and ask Allah forgiveness. Are you following? This should be your daily schedule. And have time with your nafs and sit and the dhikr of Allah alone. Wallahi, wallahi. Sometimes, I'm sure many of you experience that, you sit and you are in the dhikr with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and reflecting and you don't control your tears, right? You don't control your tears and you feel happiness but you cannot, it doesn't last for long, true or not? Flash, flash, just a flash. I wish it is there always, right? How many times you experienced that? Right? But it is just flash. So that's why you need to train the nafs. You need to train your nafs. Number nine. You should always, if you want to be loved by Allah, be in the company of the salihin, the company of the righteous, the brothers who will remind you about Allah. A brother will come to you, why didn't why did you miss the fajr today, brother? Why didn't you come to the salah? Someone who will remind you about your akhirah. Because this company, they, we strengthen each other. Are you following? Because if you are by yourself, you will feel what? Weak. But if you are in the company of your brothers, they strengthen strengthen you, support you. That's why Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said in the hadith, إِنَّمَا يَأْكُلُ الذِّئْبُ مِنَ الْغَنَمِ الْقَاسِيَةِ The wolf will devour the goat or the sheep that grazes alone. Have you seen a wolf jump into the middle of the flock? Or the wolf will look? Oh, there's one alone by itself. That is easy to catch. Are you following? So the moment you come out of the flock, are you following now? And you are by yourself. The wolf here is what? Shaitan. It's easy for the shaitan to attack you. But if you are with your brothers, then even if you become weak, they remind you. No, 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 no. Bro, come. Don't do this. 
one of my brothers, he said, I was driving, Shaitan, and I was, I did like this. So what? Seeing what? A woman. Shaitan. Hmm? We are not Malaika. Are we angels? No. So his nafs tells him, look, he did like this. He thought his brother next to him huh, would not feel it. His brother, you know what he said? He told him, the Huriya is more beautiful. The Huriya and the Jannah is more beautiful than this one. He said, his words went into his heart like an arrow. He shocked me. This is the beauty of brotherhood. There is someone who will remind you. Number 10, anything that will keep your heart far away from Allah, leave it. I'm asking you, the young boys, the youth, football, bring your heart to Allah. Movies. So anything that takes your heart away from Allah, don't like it. You only do the things that will bring your heart closer to Allah. May Allah Azza wa Jal bring our hearts closer to Him. May Allah Subhanahu wa Taala grant us His love. May Allah Subhanahu wa Taala protect us from the evil of our nafs, our souls, from the evil of the shaitan. And may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala grant us yannat al naim. Amin. And may Allah reward all of you. My dear brothers and sisters, for your patience and attendance. Jazakumullah khaira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Now it is Q and A. So can, can the sisters please write down the questions and, and pass them through? I will take the questions from the floor for the brothers. And if everybody wants to write them down, uh, just ask them, we'll give you a pen and some paper and show them. Yes. Um, what is the ruling on, uh, you know, for the children, really the Muslim? If they say they're about four or five years old, and they don't do wudu, and they place it on the table, on the floor, or on the city, and they don't really give it as a and you tell them, you know, you try to understand, keep reading, put their finger on the, uh, the letters. What is the ruling? The ulama, the question is about, about the children. They don't know. The, the manners of dealing with the Quran and this. We teach them these manners, but the ulama, they made an exception for the children. They said, if we make it difficult for them, they will start hating the Quran. Are you following? So they made an exception for the children. Though, of course, the child, we, we train the child from the beginning, we give him only yuzu by yuzu, chapter by chapter. You can get the 30 yuzu, and you can also, uh, what they call it, uh, uh, illumination or something they call it? Huh? Laminated. So he will not touch it actually directly. Are you following? And this, um, still we teach the child, this is the word of Allah, respect it, put it here and there, etc. And encourage them to read the Quran more and more. And the scholar, they made an exception for the children. Got it? Uh, uh, one brother asked me why we can't do the prayer, the salah, in any other language than Arabic. Uh, I wonder if you could just expound on it. Okay. You see, my dear brothers and sisters, the ibadah, or the ritual, or the worship itself, is risk as it is prescribed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He told us that we should worship Him as Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam worshipped Him. So He is our example. Are you following? He did not say that you can read in any other tongue. The Prophet ﷺ said, pray as you have seen me, pray. And everything he did in the Arabic tongue. Had it been permissible to be said in any other tongue, he would have 
mention that. He would have what? Mention that. Because if we say it is permissible, now in the Salah, will he be reading Quran or translation? All praise is due to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. You alone we worship and you alone we seek for help. Am I reading Quran or translation? Is this Quran? In the Salah, what do you read? You read the Quran. Are you following? And the Quran only when it is in the mother, in the Arabic tongue. That's the Quran. Are you following? So now what about a revert? The moment a brother becomes a Muslim, we will write for him the Fatiha, transliterated. Okay? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Transliteration. And he can have it in a piece of paper. And he can read it in the Salah. Until he memorizes it. And the problem is over. Are you following? So? Yes, sir. You're saying he can actually hold a piece of paper? He can. He can hold it. And when he goes to the Ruku, I put it in the pocket and goes down. No problem. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was praying in the masjid, holding his granddaughter, Zainab. And he, when he goes to Ruku', he will put the child, gets up from the Ruku', picks the child, put the child. Are you following? This is in the Salah. Ah, okay. Can a Muslim who didn't memorize the Quran read from the Quran in the Salah? We tell him this is not recommended. Read what you memorized. And even in Taraweeh, when you find everyone is opening the Quran, that's not correct. The Imam might do that only. The Imam, maybe he is not half him, he can do that. Or the one behind him, just to correct him if he makes what? A mistake. But everybody else should listen. What you see in the haram, everyone is holding mushaf. That's not the correct practice. Can you read the question to save time? In Ramadan, my family insists on cooking special food. I would prefer to have a simple meal for iftar. How can I persuade them that Ramadan is not about extravagance, but about limiting yourself? This is a beautiful question. And you see, my dear brothers and sisters, Ramadan only a few days from now. What is the purpose of fasting? To starve? No. Is Allah in need of our starving? Does Allah want to torture us? No. Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu O you who believe, Kutiba alaykum siyam Fasting has been prescribed as it was prescribed for those before you, Jews and Christians. The Jews and Christians were fasting. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Perhaps that you attain piety, taqwa. So the aim of fasting is taqwa Allah. If you don't achieve that target, that goal, you didn't get, you didn't benefit of, from, or derive any benefit from your fasting. That's why Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says in the hadith, رُبَّ صَائِمٍ لَيْسَ لَهُ مِنْ صِيَامِهِ إِلَّا الْيُعْ وَالْعَطَشِ وَرُبَّ قَائِمٍ لَيْسَ لَهُ مِنْ قِيَامِهِ إِلَّا التَّعَبُ السَّهْرِ Perhaps, an observer of fast will get only fatigueness and hunger from his fast. 
That's the only thing he will benefit. Nothing except he was tired and he was hungry. And Allah will not accept his siyam. Or perhaps a person standing the salah in taraweeh and you will get only again fatigueness, tiredness, and sleeplessness. And from the siyam he gets hunger and thirst. So if you want Allah to accept your siyam and set you free from the fire, you should work hard to achieve the taqwa. You should stop sinning. Repent. Stop doing all these types of haram you are doing. Then and only then Allah will accept your siyam. Unfortunately, many of the Muslims, they made Allah a month of extravagance. Wasting. Eating. They spend a lot of money in Ramadan. More than any other month. The poor sisters, they enter the kitchen maybe dhuhr or before dhuhr. When do they leave the kitchen? After midnight. Washing the dishes. And the husband makes samosa, makes shabati, makes biryani, make, make, make. At that time, long table, full of food. He takes a few morsels. You can't eat more than that. The rest, what do you do with it? Throw it away. So in Ramadan, you become the brother of the shaitan. Because you become extravagant. Allah says, Inna al kana fuan shayati. Those who are extravagant are the brothers of the shaitan. So you are in Ramadan, you become a brother, you get closer to the shaitan. So now let us really, we want to fast this Ramadan. We say, our the budget should be the minimum. We want to save money in Ramadan. This much of food only. We break our fast, milk and date. And this is my advice for you. And this is what I practice, alhamdulillah. When I break my fast, date and milk. I go to the salah, I go into the taraweeh, light, no problem, enjoy the salah. You take your dinner after coming from the taraweeh. But if you, the moment the adhan went, you cross your legs and start Huh? Eating, 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 eating till you cannot breathe. Right? Breathless. And then you come to the masjid and you start burping. <laughs> <laughs> True or not? This is what happens. So this is not what Islam is teaching us. And you know what? Your wife will be always praying for you. Because you will give her time for Quran, you will give her time for Salah, you will give her time for everything. Because she is going to make little food. Are you following? So that's how we should fast in Ramadan. As we should. That, that should be the true Ramadan. And work hard to achieve the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah grant us his taqwa. Amen. Question here says, what is the best time for, to make dua? There are many times which are good, you should not miss. For instance, after the five prayers between Adhan and Iqama, that is the time. This is the time you can make dua at night for tahajjud. When it is raining, mashallah, your country is always raining. Do you know this is Sunnah, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when it rains, you know what he does? He comes out in the rain, he removes the imamah, the cuff of his hair, until he's wet. And he would pray. That Allah accepts the dua at that time. So there are many times where you can make the dua. And you can make dua at any time. But the, this Timings you should never miss. The suhoor, sahar time, just before the fajr, one hour before the fajr, you get up, pray to rak'ah, and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَبِالْأَسْحَارِهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ 
at the Sahar time, they are making istighfar. Next. Okay. From here or from there? Huh? No, no, it's you are the one. I'm asking for somebody, it's not my second question. <laughs> What's, um, the brother's asking if if, uh, if there's no, if there's only masajid in your area where mm -hmm. you know they do be that, they do. Uh, they okay, have, I got it. Same third day. I know, I know. Are we allowed to go there? You see, I, I'll give you the general rule. As long as he is a Muslim, you can pray behind him. But you know that. Listen to me. If you consider him not a Muslim, don't you, you don't pray behind him. As long as he is within the fold of Islam, you pray behind him. Even if he's doing bid'ah. Even if he's doing what? Bid'ah. Your salah is correct. If the only masjid is this masjid, if there are other masjid, they don't do bid'ah, I'll go there. But if it is this masjid only, should I leave the jama'ah? The Sahaba, they were praying behind Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi. Abdullah ibn Umar was praying behind him. Al-Hajjaj was a criminal. He killed many, many people. He killed Sa'id ibn Jubayr, he killed many people. And yet, ibn Umar is praying behind him. The Muslims in Egypt, when Egypt was ruled by the Fatimites, you know the Fatimites, they were Shia, they were praying behind them, they did not leave the, the Salah, is this clear to you? See, I want to teach you, to tell you one thing here. The ruling in Islam are two types. General ruling and specific ruling. If someone asks the dead person, that is shirk, true or not, you should ask Allah. But when I come to this particular person who, who does that, I cannot say he's Kafir. Unless and until he's educated and things are made clear to him and the misconceptions and the doubts and the shubuhat are removed. Are you following? Then after that, I can say, yes, he is. Then I will not pray behind him. And who declares this? The lame man? Students of knowledge or the scholars? the scholars? It's not easy thing, my dear brothers and sisters. So I now am coming from overseas. I hear the Adhan. This is Muslim Masjid. Allahu Akbar, right? I will just go inside and pray and go. Allah will not ask me, did you know the Imam? No. My salah is correct. Alhamdulillah. Are you following? Yes. I feel, I find reading the Quran and even doing the prayers difficult at home because my children are young and don't let me do it. They start doing things that they shouldn't do. And my husband is always out, so I'm by myself looking after the children. How can I increase my Iman as I always feel down and helpless? May Allah help you, sister. The husband is, is not doing what he's supposed to do. He's a shepherd as well, right? He's responsible to help her to bring up the children. I remember now what this sister said. I was in the States, in Boston, and uh, I gave a talk to the sisters, and the brothers, they say, they, they said, uh, talk to the issues of, you know, marital relationships and all that stuff. So I was talking on romance and all that stuff. One of the sisters said, Chef, what are you talking? I don't get time to brush my teeth. I'm so busy. This is crying. This is 
vomiting. This is this. And no one is helping me. Single handed. Where is when the Prophet ﷺ said, Khayrukum, Khayrukum la ahli, the best among you are those who are the best for their wives? Prophet Muhammad ﷺ in Bukhari, Aisha said, he would come into the kitchen. Do you go to the kitchen? No, I'm a man. <laughs> the Prophet ﷺ, he enters the kitchen helping his wives. When the, the Adhan goes on, he leaves us, he goes to the masjid. What is wrong if you chain the divers or hover the house or do the washing? Your wife is your partner, she needs a hand. This is our deen, my dear brothers and sisters. Then you will have happy life and successful marital life. So make Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is your example and follow his footsteps. May Allah Azza wa Jal Make the marital lives of all Muslims successful. I mean. Is there a adab in which you make dua? Oh yes, there are adab. The you reason, don't. The reason why I'm asking is in some of the masjids, uh, the imam makes dua, although it is very short after prayer. Yeah. I mean, uh, there was a program on TV where I watched. It said that that was not the practice. Of they are adab for dua. How you make dua? First of all, you face the qibla. These are manners, adab. Second thing, you start praising Allah. You start what? Praising Allah. Second thing, making salah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. As you say, what you call it, durud? Okay. Okay, salah Ibrahimiya. Then you start asking what you want from Allah. Then praising Allah and concluding by also salah on the Prophet. This is the adab of the dua when you want to make the dua. Not just straight, oh Allah, give me this. Do you have to raise your hands? Yes, yes. You raise your hands. When you're making dua, you raise your hands. You raise your hands, yes. If your husband is a sinner, he does not pray five times a day, can you ask for a khula from him on the basis of loving Allah and hating for Allah? No. If we do, we encourage the sisters, many of the brothers, they have their own shortcomings. So this sister, she should work, work hard because she loves her husband to make him a pious husband. Are you following? She should keep reminding him, make dua for him. And there we know many sisters, mashallah, their husband start practicing Islam because of them. But the problem with many of our sisters, they make the husbands hate the deen. She's practicing the deen, and she comes to him, haram, 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 haram. Everything haram, haram. So his life becomes miserable. There's nothing halal, everything haram, haram. When the Prophet ﷺ says in the hadith, Rahim Allah, Allah, may Allah's blessings and peace upon a woman gets up at night and prays, then she wakes up her husband to pray. You get up to make the hajjud, then you come and say, Oh, my dear husband, let us pray to rak'ah. Get up. She wakes you up. Not that she comes and say, Get up, get up, get up. And you are in the deep of the sea. No, no, get up. Shaitan has passed urine into your ears. Get up. <laughs> is this the right? This is the way? No. Sweetheart, my darling, get up. Massaging him. Barakallahu feek. May Allah grant you Jannah. You are softening his heart. He will be thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah blessed him with such a wife. 
So that's how you can make your husband love this deen. The problem that some sisters, the moment they start practicing the deen, they start neglecting their obligations as a wife. I'm talking to the sister now. You know what I mean? You understand what I'm saying? As a wife, they think this is only jahiliya. They don't know that to fulfill the biological needs of your husband and to attract him and to save him from all the temptations, that is ibadah. And I mentioned this today to the sisters. That is the halal magic. To make your husband long to come to his house, to make your home heaven on earth. Not hell on earth. To make your husband when he leaves, not to look at this woman and that woman. He is completely satisfied. When he's outside, he's looking down. Don't you know there are women outside trying to steal your husband? True or not? Brothers, they know what I'm talking about. This one is in his right, this one in his left, colleagues. And they are laughing and they are smiling and they are this. And everyone comes into the office, you can smell her perfume from long distance. And when he comes home, he sniffs only the onion and the garlic and... Right? Is this the marital life? Your husband, when he comes home, you receive him at the door with a hug. Hmm? You already took a shower, food is ready. Smelling nice, taking him to the table. Allah Akbar. That is what his marital life is about. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu what did he do? The moment he enters his house, the first thing he would do, he would kiss his wife. Who practices this sunnah? This sunnah is dead. The first thing he would brush his teeth and kiss his wife. My dear brothers and sisters, if we really start practicing Islam, earth will become our heaven. Because your life will be the most beautiful life. Everything is halal. And you are getting hasanat. Imagine. Prophet Muhammad said, when you sleep with your wife, you get hasanat. The Sahaba say, how come? We fulfill our desire. We get hasanat. The Prophet said, What if he fulfills his desire in a haram way? Will he be sinful? So if you fulfill it in the halal, you get hasanat. Both of you, husband and wife. So let us balance it. Let us understand the deen. And then we enjoy and have this peace of mind in our marital life. see to read on a drink like zamzam or water for someone who is sick read ayat from the Quran this is permissible it is permissible and there are certain diseases like sihr especially there is one type of sihr where the man will not be able to sleep with his wife will not have erection. What to do in this case? You take seven green leaves of loot tree. You know the loot tree? Loot tree, L-O-T-E. I'm sure you have it here in this country. So you take seven green leaves and you crush them. You 
because you go to the doctor he will give you vitamins vitamins and you are fine but you cannot sleep with your wife so you take seven green leaves you crush them dissolve them in water and you read قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ سَنْتَ سَبْعَةً تَعْمَ قُلْ وَاللَّهُ وَحَدَّ سَبْعَةً تَعْمَ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ سَبْعَةً تَعْمَ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ سَبْعَةً تَعْمَ Reading like this, and then you take few sips, and the remaining you wash your body with it in a clean place. Like that. What do you mean by the ta'weeth? You mean the amulet? Ah, no. See, though, tell, I have to elaborate. Who is our example to follow? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was reading on Al-Hasan and Al-Husayn, reading on them. Qulu Allah wa haqqul a'udhu al-Rabbil Falaq, qulu a'udhu al-Rabbil Nas. Reading. He did not write and put around their necks. Though Abdullah ibn Amr used to do that, one of the Sahaba, and tie them. Ibn Mas'ud against it. Whom should we follow? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa or Abdullah ibn Amr? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa It's the final question, the last question. If you have a digital mushaf on your phone, for example, can you take it into the toilet? Would you? If you are half of the Quran, and can you enter the toilet? <laughs> <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Pray for me and pray for you. I love you all for the sake of Allah.